guys, I am pumped and excited today. We are kicking off a brand new series called Habits. It's two weeks long, but I think it's going to be a good one and it's powerful because we're stepping into 2020. How many people know 2020 New Year's resolutions, right? We come out and we start saying, New Year, new me. New Year, new possibilities. I'm going to get better, not bitter, right? Come on. And we come out, we say, man, 2020, we're going to come out with the New Year's resolutions. How many people know we come out with New Year's resolutions and most of them don't last? <laughs> most of them lay wayside, right? We come out, we like, man, I'm going to get serious about going to the gym this year. It's it. I'm going to meet the man of my dreams this year. I'm going to get serious about work, school. I'm going to get serious about losing weight. And we have all these wonderful New Year's resolutions. And then we get into it a couple months down the road and we forgot all about them. Why is that? It's because we create goals when there's nothing wrong with those goals. But you cannot create goals without habits. Because if you do not have habits attached to your goals, it's like picking a destination on your map without any modes of transportation. Most of you ain't going to get there. Most of you will not hitchhike to that destination. You got to have a mode of transportation. You've got to have a habit in your life that's going to lead you to the outcomes you want in life. So I want to teach and talk about this. It's going to be very practical today, but also very spiritual today. They can be simultaneously together. I know that's kind of crazy in world sometimes, but that's the way it works. God is a very practical God and a spiritual God. But first, I want to start with the definition of a habit. Take a look at it. A habit is a routine or behavior that is performed regularly and in many cases automatically. That when you develop this routine or this behavior in your life that almost happens automatically towards what you want in life, you will achieve it. So you've got to develop habits. Now I'm going to speak on a couple books that I've read over the last several years when I've studied habits in my own personal life. And one of those is a book called Atomic Habits, written by James Clear. And James kind of opens the book up with this story. He talks about the British cycling team. And the British cycling team in the early 2000s was the most mediocre cycling outfit that existed. For over 100 years, they literally only won one world championship and nothing ever else came close to it. They were considered the mediocre team. They were considered the team that no one ever thought would excel or achieve anything. And in 2004, they hired a new performance director named David Brailsforth. And David had this idea, he had this philosophy called the aggregation of marginal gains. Now this word marginal is really important because he believed that if you could find small, tiny margins improvement in many areas of your life, if you could get 1% better in several areas of your life, when they are accumulated, when they aggregate together, you have this monumental success. So that was his philosophy, and that's what he took into the cycling organization. And so he started making small changes. Some changes would be what most cyclists would make, right? He started changing the cushions and the seats so they were more comfortable to handle that long distance. He would change the type of materials and outfits they would wear that were lightweight and more aerodynamic. He put sensors on their bodies to track the biometrics that they were performing at. He would literally put heaters on their shorts to keep their muscles at the constant temperature so they wouldn't cramp or overheat. So he started doing a lot of the normal things like putting rubbing alcohol on the tires to give them better grip. But then he started working on areas outside of what most people would think of. He hired a surgeon to come in to teach them the proper way to wash their hands so that they would be less susceptible to catch colds and be sick. He studied the pillows and mattresses they slept on so they could have the most productive and best sleep possible. He literally studied different massage gels to see which one helped the best with muscle restoration. He painted the inside of every single one of their trailers that carried the bikes white. So they could spot out even the tiniest speck of dust that could get in and gunk up these fine precision machines. He did hundreds of small little improvements. And when they came together, they happened to have success greater than they could even imagine. Five years after he took over, they entered the 2008 Beijing Olympics. 
they actually won 60% of the gold medals in that games. Four years later, when the Olympics went to London, they set nine Olympic records and seven world records. In the 10 year span from 2007 to 2017, and it's actually continuing, but this is when the study was done. They have become the most dominant cycling outfit in the history of the world. They have literally have 170 world championships, 66 Olympic and Paralympic gold medals, and five Tour de France championships. An outfit that was so mediocre for 100 years, an outfit that was considered made up of ordinary people, how could they become so successful? Because David understood something that most humans miss, that when you focus on success in small areas, it leads to something monumental. Unfortunately, human nature is to focus on the big things, the big milestones. That's what we celebrate. That's what we focus on. That's what gets all our attention. I mean, think about it. You don't celebrate people when they're dating. You don't celebrate people in all those little small dates they have one-on-one, but you do celebrate a wedding ceremony, a big milestone. No one gives you a standing ovation whenever you spend hours studying for school. No one gives you that same ovation, but they do show up at your graduation ceremony, taking pictures with you in your cap and gown. Nobody gives you a pat on the back when you save money and you don't overspend and you live below your means. Nobody gets on Facebook or Instagram and gives you this big, huge shout out because you skip meals and eat it at home and live below. But they will show up to an open house party when you've actually saved enough money to put a down payment on a home. That most people only see the big moments, but they miss all the small moments along the way that leads to success. Success is not some massive goal. It's not some massive action. It's not some life-altering behavior change. Success is day in and day out being consistent with small changes in your life. If you don't believe me, you need to see what the math says. The math says it like this. If you get 1% better every single day for one year, you will actually be almost 38 times more improved than you are right now in one year. 38 times more improved. If you got 1% better in your finances every single day, your finances would improve by 38% times. If you got 1% better in your health every single day, you would be 38 times more healthier at the end of the year. If you worked on improving your marriage 1% every single day, your marriage could be 38 times more healthier in a year. If you worked on your spiritual life 1% every single day, you would be 38% more growing and more vibrant in your faith. 1%. But the same is also true in the negative. If you are 1% worse each day, you literally in a year almost hit rock bottom, you zero out. 1% where you just ignore procrastination every day. 1% where you keep negative habits every day. 1% where you keep making justifications for your choices. Every single day, you will hit rock bottom. You've got to understand the importance of growing daily, and it's not something monumental. Now, I do want to key on on one thing here. Notice right here at the beginning of your growth, this span of time where you don't really see much of a change. You see this? This is where most people quit. Because we have been bought into this microwave mentality, right? We've been bought in on instant change. We've been bought in that it needs to happen now. And because of that, we quit. Because of that, we miss out. And this is why Paul writes in Galatians something very important. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we what? Don't give up. If you don't give up, and you do the right things over an extended period of time, you will harvest the blessing you want. But it is being faithful in the small things that leads to something monumental. 
and this is what I want you to get in your spirit. So if you're gonna take notes, I want you to pull them out right now. Holy people take notes. And today that means the successful people are gonna take notes because here's what you need to understand. Successful people take notes consistently while other people do it occasionally. (laughs) But here's the reality. Successful people do consistently what other people just do occasionally, right? Everybody occasionally thinks about, you know what, I shouldn't spend money on that. Everybody occasionally says, you know what, I'm not gonna go out to eat, I'm gonna eat at home and save a little money. Everybody does that occasionally. But people that are successful financially makes this decision day in and day out. Every single day, they think about living under a budget and literally living below their means so they can take finances and put it into an interest-bearing account that will get them 37 times more successful than they were in day one. Everybody, every once in a while goes, you know what? I should eat a little bit healthier today. I probably shouldn't get that really greasy meal. Everybody occasionally says, you know what? I need to go to the gym today. But people that are successful in their health every single day thinks about the food they eat, thinks about the calories that they're consuming, thinks about being consistent with the gym. And then over time, they end up 37 times more healthier. And the same is true in your faith. Every Christian occasionally reads the Bible. Every Christian occasionally prays. Every Christian goes to church when it's convenient or what they prefer if it's conducive to their schedule. But vibrant disciples of Jesus understands when the Bible says, I will pick up my cross and die to myself, less of me, more in him, because I am going to be consistent with reading the word of God so the word of God can speak wisdom and discernment in my life. I'm gonna be consistent with praying and seeking God so he can speak conviction and direction into my heart and mind. I'm gonna be consistent with going to church because I'm gonna teach that discipline to my young children and let them understand the importance of putting God first in our week. I'm going to be consistent with tithing because God gets the first fruit. He comes first in my life. I'm going to be consistent with serving because I'm not a taker. I'm a giver. And as I pour myself out, life change happens. I'm going to be consistent with the things of God in my life because I want to grow in my faith. Something powerful happens. Now, this is a very evident in the life of many of our foundational men and women of faith when you read the word of God. But a great example of this is the man named Daniel. Now, Daniel's one of those dudes you learn about in Sunday school because it's one of those stories everybody likes, right? We like to focus on the big moments with Daniel, right? We like when Daniel gets in the lion's den and God shuts the mouth and they don't eat him, right? And the next day they're like, Daniel, what are you doing? You hanging out with the lions, you live, right? Like, bam, awesome. When you get older, you like reading about Daniel, you go, ooh, Daniel, man, he's a good leader, rose the ranks, running the whole place. Everybody looked at him for wisdom. Bam, boom, awesome. I want to be that. And one we think, we think Daniel achieved those things because of one massive action, one light switch moment. That's not what happened. Daniel was faithful in small disciplines that led to something monumental in his life. If you actually read the story of Daniel, you're gonna start seeing some of that stuff unfold. Let's look at chapter six, verse three. Watch this. Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps. Did you see that? Daniel so distinguished himself. Do you know what the writer's saying here? He wasn't distinguishing by himself. He wasn't just one of those people that just stood out. He did something that caused him to rise above the crowd. There was something in his life that caused him to rise. How do I know this? Daniel was a foreigner. Foreigners were always overlooked. Daniel was a prisoner of war. He was a captive. He was considered a slave. He was considered less than. Daniel was considered someone to be mocked. And especially in the prideful, arrogant nation that he was a captive in, they definitely didn't look at foreigners of giving them advice and wisdom, but something caused him to be distinguished. What was it? You continue to read. By his exceptional qualities. Other translations say his excellent qualities spirit that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. 
Did you get that? It was by his excellent spirit. That's his character. That's his discipline. That's his work ethic. That's his integrity. And those things don't just happen one day. They don't just happen in one moment. They don't happen because of one massive goal. They happen because you are consistently faithful day in and day out. It causes something to grow in your life. And if you read the life of Daniel, you'll see that he was faithful and consistent with his eating and his diet. He was faithful and consistent with learning and being an educated man and growing in his leadership qualities. But he was also an extremely faithful and disciplined with the spiritual disciplines in his life as a follower of a God. And he literally made that his number one priority because Daniel understood something very important that most people miss. Write this in your notes we naturally drift towards complacency, but we strategically plan for growth. That if you just do what you've always done without being conscious of your decisions, you will naturally settle. You will naturally drift towards complacency. You will naturally float down to rock bottom. But if you want to grow in your life, you gotta be strategic. You got to plan for it. You got to desire it and add discipline to it because dreams without discipline is fantasy. And a lot of us are good at living fantasies. We're good at making up a whole list of New Year's resolutions, but we're really bad at seeing them become realities in our lives. And why is that? Because there's a lot of outside forces that are trying to keep you from growth. Maybe those outside forces are physical. Maybe they're physical people trying to keep you from growth. Maybe you're surrounding yourself with people that like to procrastinate, that like to settle, and they want to keep you at their level because they don't want discipline or integrity and growth in their lives. Maybe they're not followers of God. Maybe they don't believe the principles of God. Maybe they don't want to have spiritualism. So they don't want you to be radical and passionate and pursuing that. They want you down at their level. Maybe the forces is your own mindsets and mentalities. Maybe you look at yourself in the mirror and say, this is just the way it's always gonna be. I will always be who I've always been. Maybe it's because you've had a series of failures in your life. Maybe because somebody said something negative to you or mistreated you or harmed you, maybe some tragedy, but you've made up your mind, this is your life and you will settle for it. Maybe it's because you got some unhealthy motivations in your life. Maybe you want vengeance. Maybe you want justice. Maybe you got pride or greed or selfishness. Maybe you think you got to prove to the world you are successful because you feel insecure and like you are meaningless. And that will never sustain you over the long long haul. And mainly, it's spiritual. You have an enemy of of your soul that does not want you walking in your God-given design. He does not want you to understand that Jesus says, I've come to give you a life and a life more abundantly. He wants to be the thief that still kills and destroys the very things in your life. And if you do not understand that, you are going to always settle and naturally drift towards complacency. And Daniel had this going on. Daniel's thriving, Daniel's growing, Daniel's got disciplines, Daniel's got habits, Daniel has got an excellent spirit that is causing the king to notice him and the locals in this area cannot stand it about him. So they say, man, we're going to conspire to get this dude out of here. We're going to conspire to get rid of him. Outside forces coming against Daniel. Watch what it says when we pick up the story. The administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of the government affairs, but they were unable to do so. Why? Because he had a character. He had an integrity. He had an excellent spirit goes on to say they could not find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. Goes on to say, finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has to do with the law of his God. We will never be able to get him where it hurts most unless we attack the deepest things into his life. Those things that he practices day in and day out. Those things that are foundational in his life. So they came up with this idea. Hey, the king, he's pretty prideful. He likes life to be about him. We're going to trick him. We're going to say, hey, king, 
for 30 days, let's make a law that nobody worships anybody but you. They pray to you, they worship you, they literally exalt you. And if anybody prays to anything other than you, if they worship anything other than you, we gonna throw them in the lion's death for a sentence to death. They gotta die, right? We gonna throw them in the lion's den. And the king's like, I like that. I like people worshiping me. I like people celebrating me. Make it a law. And he did. Little did he know they were making it exactly about Daniel. So Daniel hears this law's passed and watch what he responds with. Watch this. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. I want you to get that in your spirit. He went and he opened the windows for the whole city to see. He says, you may make it a law to tell me I can't be who I'm called to be. You may make it a law that I can't worship my God. I'll still do it and I'll do it in the open and in the public. Then watch this. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God. What? Just as he's done before. This wasn't a new habit. It wasn't just something he invented. This is something he did every single day, day in and day out, three times a day. He said, God, you come first. You are my beginning. You are my middle. You are my end. I seek you for the beginning of my day. I seek you in the middle of my day. I close out my day with you on my mind. Every day I have a habit to pray and seek. Every day you are the one that guides me. Every day you are the one that convicts me. Every day you give me discernment. Every day you give me wisdom. Every day I put you first because I I understand one thing very important the small moments with God matters and this is what you got to get in your spirit write this in your notes God can do monumental miracles through one small habit of obedience you're not called to be the miracle worker you're called to be the faithful child you're not called to change your entire life you're called to be obedient and let God change your entire life. You're not called to heal or change other people. You're called to be faithful and a steward with your opportunities and the Holy Spirit changes people. The Holy Spirit moves in the lives of people. The Holy Spirit's what changes life. You are called to be obedient. Daniel did what he'd always, always done. He was faithful with a small moment and then he stood before a lion and the mouth was shut and the king fell and said, we will worship the one living God. You are staring at your marriage right now and it's about to die and the only way God's going to shut the mouth of the lion is if you're a servant and a steward of what you've been given you've been given opportunities you've been given moments of faithfulness grow in it you're never going to see a miracle in your finances if you don't start tithing and putting God first and being a steward in it you're never going to see purpose in your life if you can't serve in the moments you've been given now one small moment leads to something monumental and if you don't get that you're gonna miss it I love what Jesus says oh you just need to have faith as what small as a mustard seed you could say to this mountain move from here to there and it would move nothing would be impossible to God she gotta believe she gotta understand it she gotta get it in your spirit Here's what I know though. We're really good at seeing the outcomes of what we want. But we're really bad at seeing the steps to take us to get there. We're really good at seeing some big massive thing we want in life. And we're really good at just saying, what's 1% of growth? What's 1% of decline? Does it really matter? Does this 1% of compromise really matter? Does this 1% of discipline really matter? It does over time. Because here's what you've got to understand. Habits have compound interest. Because they have compound interest of self-growth and self-improvement when you do it over the long haul. You've got to get this in your spirit. There's a book called The Power of Habits. And in this book, they introduce something called a keystone habit. And a keystone habit basically is this. It's one habit that when you place in your life consistently, 
causes a snowball or a domino effect that creates positive momentum that leads to other positive habits in your life. But the same is true in the negative. That one missed habit can create negative momentum that can lead to negative habits in your life. A good example is this. I like to go to the gym. And when I go to the gym consistently, I find myself making smarter choices when I eat. And when I start making smarter choices when I eat and I I go to the gym more consistently, I find I have more energy. When I go to the gym consistently, it's a time for me to literally empty my mind and get clarity. I listen to podcasts are about growth. I get inspired. I get more momentum. I have better days at work and I'm way more productive and way more happy. Same thing goes though this. When I don't go to the gym consistently, I find myself making more compromises in my diet. And when I make more compromises in my diet, I get a little bit more chunkier. And when I get a little bit more chunkier, I start complaining to my wife that I look fluffy and fat. And when I start complaining to my wife that I look fluffy and fat, she gets annoyed with me and gets mad at me and it puts me in a bad mood because she's supposed to tell me you look amazing and look wonderful and look at those abs. She doesn't do that. And then when I get more like that, I'm not taking time to drain my mind. I'm thinking about things. I'm not having self-growth. I start having bad days. I start having bad days at work. I'm not performing to the level I should. I end up losing my job. Then I become more depressed. I eat more. I get fatter. I need a new wardrobe, but I can't afford it because I don't got a job. And now all my shirts fit like two tops. I may exaggerate just a little bit there, okay? Because my wife says, I always have rock hard abs. Come on, somebody. (laughs) But did you get the point? One habit for the positive and the negative can lead to something monumental. And this is what you got to understand. Write this in your notes. Your habits are how you embody your identity. And your identity is literally your repeated beingness. What does that mean? That you, what you do day in and day out is a reflection of who you are or who you think you are. And that's going to affect what you become in life. A lot of times we know the outcomes we want. We say, I know, I know the weight I want to weigh. I know the amount of salary I want to make. I, I know the type of marriage I want. Like we say all the things we want, and, but those are outcome based. And if you're only focused on the exterior, you will never have sustainability. You got to focus on the interior. You got to understand your identity. Towards the end of Paul's life, he's writing to Timothy. And Timothy's his protege. It's his mentee. It's who he's kind of raised up. And Timothy's a young leader who's a young pastor. He's a young plant church planter. He's a young pastor. And he's, he's literally raising him up. And, and Timothy's got a lot of questions on how do you run a church and how do you lead people? And it's a lot of exterior things. He's like, how do I, how do I pray dynamically? How do I have a powerful church service? How do I lead and pick elders and leaders in the church? And how do I deal with false teachers that are trying to divide the church? And how do I take care of elders and widows and all these questions? And Paul's going through the whole list and saying, yeah, all that's great. Let me teach you all this stuff. But he ends his letter writing to Timothy something very powerful. He says something to close this thing out. He says, Timothy, you got to get this in your spirit. Watch what he says here. He says, Timothy, you are a man of God. Did you see that? He looks at Timothy and says, Timothy, let me tell you your identity. Let me tell you who you are. Because none of the external will change unless the internal changes. You are a man of God. And because you're a man of God, you run from evil things. You run from negative habits. You run from bad habits. You run from the things that are keeping you back. You're running from the things that are keeping you. Because you know who you are, you run from the things that you shouldn't have and you pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, gentleness, Timothy, Guard what God has entrusted you with. Did you see that? Because you know who you are. You know what to get away from and you know what to pursue. You know what habits and actions that you need in your life so your identity can come to fruition in your heart and mind. Because this is what you got to understand. Write this in your notes. True behavior change is identity change. True behavior change is identity change. Listen to me. 
If you're not paying attention to me, you're gonna miss the best life of 2020. Because you know what you're telling me? If you're not paying attention, you're telling me I'm okay being who I am. And I've settled for an identity I shouldn't be. I've settled for a marriage I shouldn't have. I've settled for finances I shouldn't have. I've settled for a lack of purpose I shouldn't have because I'm okay not changing anything in my life. That's exactly the whispers of the devil. That's the whispers of pride that wants to keep you from who you're called to be. You know what I do every single day? I ask myself, what's the husband I wanna be? Because I fail more times than I win. I ask myself, what's the parent I wanna be? Because I fail more times than I win. I ask myself, what's the pastor and leader I wanna be? Because I'm not gonna settle for my past. I got a future greater and I'm gonna change the habits and the actions and decisions in my life because I know who I'm called to be in my spirit. So you gotta get it in your spirit. So here's some action steps I want you to get. I want you to get this so deep in your spirit. I'm gonna close out. You've got to, number one, decide the type of person you wanna be. You gotta be clear with who you wanna be as a person. Decide the type of person you wanna be. What are your values? What are your principles? What do you stand for? What do you wanna be known for? And you may say, Pastor Mike, that's big questions, dude. I don't know how to answer that. I don't know what my values are. I don't know what my principles are. I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't know what I want to be known for. I, I don't know those questions, and most people don't. You know the salary you want. You know the marriage you want. You know the weight you want to wear, weigh. But you don't necessarily know the, you know the outcomes. Well, let me teach you how to get there. You got to take your outcomes and work backwards. And you do that by answering this question. Who is the type of person that could get the outcome I want? Who is the type of person that gets the outcome I want in life? Who's the type of person, who's the type of disciple that has a vibrant faith? They probably have self-discipline. They're probably not emotionally charged. They're probably somebody that has a servant's heart. They probably love people so much that they desire to see them grow and progress in life. They probably have joy, not rooted in the circumstances of the world, but in their design, in their calling that God has given them. They probably have peace, not when the storms come, but peace that the word of God is true. It's living and active. That's the type of person that's a virus. I know those traits. Who's the type of husband that has a marriage that I want? They're probably someone that doesn't have pride, but has humility. They're probably always somebody that says, you know what, I'm not gonna focus on what's fair, I'm gonna focus on what's right. And I'm called to love my wife like Christ loves the church and I'm called to die for her, not to live for my pride and my selfishness. Those are the traits I know I should have. Who's the type of person that has the salary that I wanna earn? They're probably someone that is a self-grower and a self-learner. They're probably someone that never thinks they've arrived, but is always willing to grow and correct themselves. They're probably a team player. They're probably somebody that wakes up early and they put their heart and soul into everything they do. They're probably someone that's a problem solver, not a problem point outer. Who's the type of person that has the health that I want, the parents the way I want? You gotta ask yourself those questions. And then when you answer those questions, you understand the identity and the behavior, you answer the second question. You prove it to yourself with small wins. See, a lot of times this is where we miss it. We want instant things. That's why we play the lottery. Because we want to instantly be rich. It's why we quit our jobs. Because we want instant happiness and we don't want to work through the drudge. It's why we get divorced. Because instead of working on something, we want instant change. You don't realize this, but that is keeping you in the devil's hands and the devil's playground and out of the plan of God. Because God says, I've given you two talents. I've given you four talents. I've given you five talents. Those are just opportunities. What are you gonna do with them? And I love what it says in Zechariah. Don't despise small beginnings. Why? because God rejoices to see the work begin. Don't despise where you're at. Look at it as an opportunity that today I'm gonna get 1% healthier. 
because God rejoices every step you take. Yes, Mike, I gotta get all the way across that stage, but every step, day one, God's rejoicing me. Day two, God's celebrating me. Day three, the heavens are on their feet. Angels are championing me along. Day four, the heroes of our faith is encouraging me from the clouds of heaven. You can do it. God rejoices to see the work begin. Gotta get stepping. And this is why I want you to get this in your spirit. Watch this. Your habits shape your identity and your identity shapes your habits. Know who you are and your actions will reflect that. In the book Atomic Habits, there's a story about one of his friends that wanted to lose 100 pounds. And to do that, she asked herself a series of questions that influenced her actions. She would say every single day when she would be forced with choices, she would say, would a healthy person walk or take a cab? She started walking. When she stood before a menu to eat, she would say, would a healthy person order a burrito or a salad? Right? She started making healthy. When she'd get home and she was a little tired of the work, she'd say, would a healthy person go to the gym for an hour or would they watch Netflix? Would they go to the gym for an hour and then come home and watch Netflix, right? What would, and she started saying, making the decision. If I started acting like a healthy person long enough, I would become a healthy person. And she was right. She lost over 100 pounds. Here's the challenge I want to give you. If you start acting like that healthy spouse long enough, you will be a healthy spouse. If you start acting like the leader you're called to in your workplace long enough, you will become that leader in your workplace. If you start acting like someone that is financially stable long enough, you will start having financial stability. Because here's what I know. I'm certain with this. I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. Where do you need to start? I'm gonna hit you with something and it's cliche, but it's okay with me. Start with 21 days of prayer. Pastor Mike, oh, you just want to get a crowd here at the event. I mean, why do I care about that? I've been doing 21 days of prayer when I would be the only one showing up six o'clock in the morning. You understand for years, I was the only one that showed up in the auditorium, a whole pot of coffee to myself, nobody came. Because I didn't care about that. You know what I care about? Less of me, more in him. I want him to give me discernment. I want him to convict my spirit. And I want the same thing for you. Yes, it's hard getting up at six, to be here at six o'clock every single morning. Good. Yes, it's hard fasting for 21 days. No food. Good. You're supposed to carry your cross. You're supposed to die to yourself so that he can live. That's why Paul says, I boast about my weakness. Because when I'm in my weakest moment, he's made strong. So good. Quit walking on the fumes of your strength and start gliding on the abundance of the strength of God. Let 21 days of prayer be a monumental moment for you. One small act of obedience can lead to something monumental. But you know what else it can lead to? It can lead to your life being changed. Your eternity looking different. Because there's people in this room right now that do not have a relationship with Jesus. There's people right now that maybe are new to church. They're new to this whole thing about God. Or maybe you used to have a relationship with Jesus, but you've walked away. And you know you're not living a life pleasing to God. And right now you need one small act of obedience. You need to pray for the forgiveness of God and give him your life. And believe he hears your prayers. It seems so small and insignificant in this moment. But it is so monumental in the grand scheme of things when eternity is involved. And all you have to do, the Bible says, just say with your mouth, forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, come be a part of my life. Forgive me. And then you gotta believe in your heart. He's not rotting in a grave somewhere. He's a resurrected king sitting at the right hand of God. And when you pray, he responds. So when everybody bow your heads, nobody looking around and want nobody moving around. Take your hand and place it over your heart. It's a symbol of your soul. And repeat after me, dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose from the grave. 
And I believe your blood washes away all sins. Come be a part of my life. I am forgiven. I am chosen. I do matter. And today I give you my life. Holy Spirit, right now we put ourselves in a posture of surrender. 2020 is a year where we surrender everything and let you be the Lord of our lives. You are in charge. Fill our minds with your thoughts. Fill our ears with your voice. Fill our eyes to see what you see. And let us go the places you're calling us to go. And let us speak the life that you've called us to speak. We give you our lives right now and surrender. With every head bowed, I want nobody looking around. If you made that commitment today for the first time, or you recommitted your life to Jesus, I'm going to ask you to do something very bold and brave. It's crazy bold, but in just a second, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. Why do I do that? Because I want this to be a keystone moment for you. I want this to be the first day of a catalyst of change in your life. And I want you to be proud about it. I want you to be excited about it. Because heaven is rejoicing. You're a part of my family of faith. And I want to rejoice with you. So on the count of three, I want to see hands all over this place raised if you made that commitment today. One, don't be afraid. Two, we go celebrate together. Three. What's up, family? Man, I'm so excited that you just tuned in to one of the messages here at Bloom, and I hope it really blessed you. If you'd like to stay up with Bloom, you can follow us on all social media sites at Church Bloom. And if this was really a blessing to you and you want to continue to support our ministry and love to donate, you can go to bloomhere.org slash give or text the five-digit number listed right here below. Guys, we are blessed. Hope you tune in next time. I pray God's peace.